Good morning. My name is Keats Meyer, and I'm the Executive Director of the Madison Square Park Conservancy. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you here this morning for a conversation with artist Abigail DeVille and Professor Edward Berenson. The park has remained open throughout this pandemic. Uh, we're very proud of being able to provide a space that um, allows for respite and relief from this, well, during this terrible time. Um, we have a few housekeeping items I should mention. One, um, if you have a question during the conversation, please put it into the chat function and uh, we, Brooke will review the questions at the during the question and answer period. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Brooke Kamen Rappaport, our Deputy Director and Martin Friedman, Chief Curator. Hi Keats, good morning, thank you. Um, hello everyone, thank you so much for joining Madison Square Park Conservancy this morning. I'm honored uh, to welcome our speakers, artist Abigail DeVille and Professor Edward Berenson. Before I introduce them, I wanna thank and acknowledge uh, my colleagues, Dana Klein and Hannah Sturz for their important efforts on these Zoom programs. As well, I'd like to share this slide and thank those who support Abigail's Light of Freedom and those who are ongoing patrons of the Conservancy's art program. It has been gratifying to work together with those supporters to bring Abigail's sculpture and the ongoing inspiring public art projects into civic space. In June, um, Hannah will take the first slide, thank you. In, in June, just a few months ago, the Conservancy approached Abigail DeVille about making a piece that could address the civil crisis due to the pandemic, presidential election, and protests erupting across the country. How could public art right now impact people and communities and respond through an artist's work? Abigail's response began with research into the history of Madison Square Park, and she studied these photographs um, in the New York Public Library collection of the truly surreal arm and 16 foot high torch of the Statue of Liberty that were displayed in Madison Square Park between 1876 and 1882 as a fundraising effort. She then um, made this drawing and computer rendering for Light of Freedom. The sculpture was fabricated in the summer and fall and opened on October 27th. Um, like the Statue of Liberty, the use of light by the artist adds luminosity and becomes a magnet for viewers. Light of Freedom is a powerful work made of Abigail's signature materials of found objects and a sculpture that confronts New York history, African American history, and today's Black Lives Matter movement. One essential inspiration um, for Light of Freedom is the colossal neoclassical figure from 1886, which has long beckoned the tired, poor, and huddled masses coming into New York Harbor. But does the light from that torch reach all people? Who are welcomed and who are excluded? Um, this is the charcoal and white chalk 1875 presentation drawing in the Metropolitan Museum collection by the French artist and designer Frédéric Auguste Bertoldi. Um, it's a nighttime view of the Statue of Liberty with rays emanating from her crown and torch. Today's seminar is going to consider the statue um, and the meaning of the statue across time and her selective embrace of citizens. Lady Liberty is a monument demonstrating how the symbolism and interpretation surrounding famous recognized works in our culture can transform across time and generations. She hawked cigarettes in 1914. She became the protector um, and defender in World War II, in, in World War I and World War II. Um, in 1958, three members of the Little Rock Nine, Thelma Mothershead, Jefferson Thomas, and Carlotta Walls, having recently enrolled in the formerly all-white Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas, they visited the statue, signed the guest register, and found press attention when they did. 
white women feminists demonstrated before her in 1970 and Vietnam veterans occupied her for two days in 1971. Um, and in 2018, Therese Akamau climbed to the base to protest the Trump, Trump administration's immigration policies. Last month, following the election of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, artist Deborah Cass posted this image, summoning Dorothy waking up from a nightmare in the final scene of The Wizard of Oz. So why hasn't the statue been implicated in the debate on historic monuments? Probably because Lady Liberty can morph and renew across decades. Despite her welded iron frame and copper surface, the 300 foot, five foot high sculpture has been surprisingly malleable over 134 years. She can assume and accept the most pressing issues in American society. And our speakers are going to focus on these questions in their remarks this morning. Um, Abigail DeVille, was born in 1981 and maintains a studio in the Bronx. She received a BFA from the Fashion Institute of Technology, attended Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture and received an MFA from Yale. She has participated in distinguished national and international residency programs, including the Studio Museum in Harlem, the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study Fellowship, Rauschenberg Foundation in Captiva and the American Academy in Rome Rome Prize. She is on faculty at the Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore and will be teaching at Yale School of Art this spring. Uh, she has exhibited at the Contemporary Art Museum in St. Louis, the Institute of Contemporary Art in LA, the New Museum and the State Lick in Amsterdam. Uh, Edward Berenson is professor and chair of the history department at New York University. He's a cultural historian specializing in the history of modern France and its empire with additional interests in the history of Britain, the British Empire and the US. He is the author of The Statue of Liberty, A Transatlantic Journey published by Yale in 2012. Berenson has won um, distinguished teaching awards from UCLA and the American Historical Association. In 2006, he was decorated by the French government as Chevalier dans l'Ordre du Mérite, and from 2015 to 2019, he served as senior fellow at the National September 11th Memorial Museum. Professor Berenson holds a BA from Princeton, a diploma in French language and civilization from the Sorbonne, and a PhD from the University of Rochester. It is a great honor to welcome you both um, this morning. Thank you so much. Abigail is going to speak, then Ed will follow, um, and finally we'll take your questions at the conclusion. Abigail, please. Thank you, Brooke, and thank you, Professor Berenson, and everyone for coming and sharing with us this morning. Um, I didn't want to talk too much because I really just want to hear Professor Berenson, so uh, I thought I would use another artist's words that I thought encapsulates all of the things that I was thinking about in preparing and thinking through the, the torch form of uh, the Statue of Liberty. It's a poem by Langston Hughes that he wrote in 1943 called Freedom's Plow. When a man starts out with nothing, when a man starts out with his hands, empty but clean, when a man starts to build a world, he starts first with himself and the faith that is in his heart, the strength there, the will there to build. First in the heart is the dream. Then the mind starts seeking a way. His eyes look out onto the world, on the great wooded world, on the rich soil of the world, of the rivers of the world. The eyes see there are materials for building, see the difficulties too and the obstacles. The mind sees a way to overcome these obstacles. The hand seeks tools to cut the wood, to till the soil and harness the power of the waters. Then the hand seeks other hands to help a community of hands to help. Thus the dream becomes not one man's dream alone, but a community dream. Not my dream alone, but our dream. Not my world alone, but your world and my world, belonging to all the hands who build. A long time ago, but not too long ago, ships came from across the sea, bringing the pilgrims and the prayer makers, adventurers and booty seekers, free men and indentured servants, slave men and slave masters, all new, to a new world, America. 
With billowing sails, the galleons came, bringing men and dreams, women and dreams, and little bands together, heart reaching out to heart, hand reaching out to hand, they began to build our land. Some were free hands seeking a greater freedom. Some were indentured hands hoping to find their freedom. Some were slave hands guarding their hearts, the seed of freedom. But the word was always there, freedom. Down into the earth went the plow in, in the free hands and the slave hands in indentured hands and adventurous hands, turning the rich soil went the plow in many hands that planted and harvested the food that fed and the cotton that clothed America. Clang against the trees went the ax into the many hands that hewed and shaped the rooftops of America. Splash into the rivers and seas went the boat hulls that moved and transported America. Crack went the whips that drove the horses across the plains of America. Free hands and slave hands, indentured hands, adventurous hands, white hands and black hands held the plow handles, ax handles, hammer handles, launched the boats and whipped the horses that fed and housed and moved America. Thus together through labor, all these hands made America. Labor, out of labor came villages and the towns that grew cities. Labor, out of labor came the rowboats and the sailboats and the steamboats, came the wagons and the coaches, covered wagons, stage coaches. Out of labor came the factories, came the foundries, came the roads, came the marts and markets, shops and stores, came the mighty products molded, manufactured, sold in shops, piled in warehouses, shipped the wide world over. Out of labor, white hands and black hands came the dream, the strength, the will, and the way to build America. Now it is me here and you there. Now it is Manhattan, Chicago, Seattle, New Orleans, Boston, and El Paso. Now it's the USA. A long time ago, not too long ago, a man said, all men are created equal by their creator with, with certain unalienable rights. Among these, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. His name was Jefferson. There were slaves then, but in their hearts, the slaves believed him too, and silently took for granted that what he said was also meant for them. It was a long time ago, but not so long ago that Lincoln said, no man is good enough to govern another man without that other's consent. There were slaves then too, but in their hearts, the slaves knew that what he said must be meant for every human being, else it had no meaning for anyone. Then a man said, better to die free than to live slaves. He was a colored man who had been a slave but had run away to freedom and the slaves knew what Fre Frederick Douglass said was true. With John Brown at Harper's Ferry, Negroes died. John Brown was hung. Before the Civil War, days were dark and nobody knew for sure when freedom would triumph or if it would, though some, but others knew it had to triumph. In those dark days of slavery, guarding in their hearts the seed of freedom, the slaves made up a song, keep your hand on the plow, hold on. That song meant just what it said, hold on, freedom will come. Keep your hand on the plow, hold on. Out of the war it came, bloody and terrible, but it came. Some there were, as always, who doubted that the war would end right, that slaves would be free or that the union would stand. But now we know how it all came out. Out of the darkest days for people and a nation, we know how it came out. There was light when the battle clouds rolled away. There was a great wooded land and men united as a nation. America is a dream. The poet says it was promises. The people say it's promises that will come, will come true. The people do not always say things out loud, nor write them down on paper. The people often hold great thoughts in their deepest hearts and sometimes only blunderingly express them, haltingly and stumblingly say them and falsely put them into practice. The people do not always understand each other, but there is somewhere there always the trying to understand and the trying to say, you are a man. Together, we are building our land. America, land created in common, dream nourished in common, Keep your hand on the plow, hold on. If the house is not yet finished, do not, don't be discouraged, builder. If the fight is not yet won, don't be weary, soldier. The plan and the pattern is here, woven from the beginning into the warp and woof of America. All men are created equal. No man is good enough to govern another man without his consent. Better die free than, than to live slaves. Who said those things, Americans? Who owns those words, America? Who is America? You, me, we are America. To the enemy who would conquer us from without, we say no. 
to the enemy who would divide and conquer us from within, we say no. Freedom, brotherhood, democracy, to all the enemies of these great words, we say no. A long time ago, an enslaved people heading toward freedom made up a song, keep your hand on the plow, hold on. The plow plowed a new furrow across the fields of history, and into that furrow the freedom seed was dropped. From that seed a tree grew, is growing, and will ever grow. That tree is for everybody, for all America, for all the world. May its branches spread and shelter grow until all races and all peoples know its shade. Keep your hand on the plow. Hold on. I'm gonna turn it over to Edward. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Abigail, for that really extraordinary. I think I'm un unmuted now. I just thank thank you, Abigail, for that extraordinary piece, and also for your 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 beautiful sculpture. And I, I look forward to seeing that in person really soon. Now let me sh share my screen and start. So if anybody knows anything about the, the Statue of Liberty, in addition to, of course, the, her physical presence, they know the poem by Emma Lazarus, the, the New Colossus. And, and, and here you see the plaque that is hammered onto the base of the, of the Statue of Liberty. And it, it, it lists this really amazing poem. And in a way, it's, it's unfortunate that this is the, the, the main and, and in some cases the only way we know about Emma Lazarus because in her very short life, which was only 37 years long, she really became one of the greatest women of letters in this country in, in the 19th century. And so she wrote this poem in 1883 as part of a fundraising operation for the building of the, of the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty. And in this, and she starts out this poem by saying that the new Colossus, the Statue of Liberty is not like the brazen giant of Greek fame. And what she meant was that it was not going to be the Colossus of Rhodes. And here you see a, a common 19th century image of a Colossus whose job is to patrol the gates to Rhodes and to, to keep out undesirables. Well, that's not what the, the Statue of Liberty was, was going to be all about. She was going to be a mighty woman a mother of exiles, and from her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome, worldwide welcome. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuge of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless tempest tossed to me. And so we, we, we know these, the, these words, but it's really important to, to repeat them for, for Lazarus. The Statue of Liberty was the mother of exiles, and she was a powerful woman. And you can you can see in 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 these images here that that her back foot is is raised as if she's stepping forward, and her, she's holding with a very strong arm a torch up in the air, and this view from behind, which you can see from New Jersey, shows a really powerful, is a different image from the one that we heard recently from Ken Cuccinelli, who was the acting director of the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. And he said, give me your tired, your poor, who could stand on their own two feet and who will not be a public charge. Well, this is a very, very different message, as, as you can see from the original message that Emma Lazarus gave us. But it, it's important to point out, and here I'm going to put on my historian's hat, <clears throat> that this point of view from, from Cuccinelli has a, a, a historical pedigree. And, and that is that, that going all the way back to the 1890s, there was an alternative to Lazarus's public and positive image of immigration, of welcome 
to, to, to people coming from abroad. And here's a, a poem written just a few years after Lazarus's poem by Thomas Bailey Aldrich, who was the editor of Harper's Magazine, a major, a, a major publication. And, and in this poem, Aldrich worries about what he calls unguarded gates. Wide open unguarded stand our gates and through them presses a wild motley throng, men from the Volga and Tartar steppes, these bringing with them unknown gods and rites. And he concludes his poem by appealing to the Statue of Liberty as a white goddess. Oh, Liberty, white goddess, is it well to keep these gates unguarded? And so, Early on, there was a view of immigration that was favorable. And you saw everywhere, political students, this was one of the major satirical mag magazines. You see a Statue of Liberty hiking up her skirts because the refuge from Europe is being dumped at her feet. And here you see a kind of Wall Street guy who is uh, happy about this because uh, this European riffraff is, is going to presumably fuel the, the American economy and enrich the Wall Street guy. You, you can't see this very well, but what, what, it, what it's inscribed on the ship, it says European garbage ship. And here's a flag that says the, the, the same thing. And here's yet an even more graphic image. And you can see uh, the e Evening Telegraph, New York paper, September 10th, 1892. And here is the Statue of Liberty holding her nose because the dregs of Europe are being dumped at her feet. And she's holding a bottle of carbolic acid, which was the most potent disinfectant of that, of, of that time. And so these are obviously extremely hostile images of, of immigration. And so, so all throughout the history of the Statue of Liberty, we have these competing images. Lazarus is welcome by the mother of, of exiles and uh, Cuccinelli's contemporary version of these 19th century, more hostile ideas about what immigration can do. Now, when we go back to the origins of the Statue of Liberty, it, 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 it makes sense to, to, to ask the question, well, what did the, the sculptor, Frédéric Auguste Bartholdi, what did he have in mind when he created the, the, the Statue of Liberty? And one of the main things that he had in mind was the, the commemoration of the end of the Civil War and the abolition of slavery in the United States. And in one of the earliest models that, that, that Bartoli built, you see in the hand that would eventually hold a tablet saying 1776, you see a broken chain, a broken chain symbolizing the abolition of, of slavery. And although the broken chain in Liberty's hands got lost, they remained under her feet. And so the, the Statue of Liberty we, that we know, you see her stomping on a broken chain. And so that uh, we know that, that, that Bartholdi belonged to France's abolitionist society because France also had slavery in its, in its colonies, although they abolished slavery before, before we did. And, um, and so it was really important to him to, to represent this project that he was going to create as involving the abolition of uh, commemorating and celebrating the abolition of, of slavery. But Bartholdi had other things in mind too. And, and he had the heritage of, of French liberty going back to the, the French Revolution. And so in this iconic painting by, by Delacroix from, from 1830, you, you see a kind of potent female image of, of liberty in motion, but there's, there's violence involved here. You have these young men with, with weapons and their, and their dead bodies here. And, and Bartholdi, although he was influenced by this, he, he wasn't wild about this image of liberty. He preferred this one from the, 
the, the French Republic in 1848. And here you see a calmer, more staid version of, of liberty. There's, there's, no, there's no violence here and she's not, she's not in motion and she's holding the torch of en enlightenment, but calmly. Barsholdi was a moderate and he believed in a, a, a calm, sort of sedate form of, of liberty, not the French revolutionary liberty, but something closer to the American revolutionary version of, of, of liberty. And this is what, what, what Barsholdi admired about the United States, at least his somewhat idealistic understanding of the United States is that, that the US, unlike France, came up with a version of, of liberty that could be nonviolent and could work. And so here you can, you can see already in 1848, the, the, the image of what will become the Statue of Liberty taking shape. And, 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 and this really influenced Bartoldi. He had all this iconography in his head as he thought about what the, the Statue of Liberty would, would look like. But he was also thinking of the colossal and here is the, obviously the Arc de, de Triomphe, which was built, started by Napoleon and, and, and finished a couple of days, uh, decades later to, 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 in a colossal way, represent the glory of Napoleonic France. And, and so Bartholdi wanted to, to, to put into his statue, which would be a gift to the United States eventually, took a while for him to get to that idea, but he would put in the colossal. And so you have the abolition of slavery, you have the, the, the images from the American and French revolutions of liberty, a female goddess, Greco-Roman goddess that symbolizes liberty. And, and then you have the Colossal. And, and so he was thinking of the, of the, the Colossus of Rhodes and, and you can see some similarities. And uh, Brooke is all, you know, see how Moldy was influenced by these nine classical Colossus would, would, would look like. I've got a message saying my internet is unstable, so I, I hope everybody can, 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 can hear me. Okay, so the, uh, the other thing that's important to, 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 to mention is that, that, that Bartholdi took a trip to, to Egypt in the 18, 1850s and he photographed these ancient colonies. So this also, he wanted to build something with the staying power of these ancient Egyptian sculptures. And so all these things to, to think about what his sculpture, sculpture would, would look like. But his first idea was not to build it in New York Harbor, but actually to, to erect it at the southern opening of the new Suez Canal which opened in, in, in 1868. It was built by a, a, a French engineer, Ferdinand de Lesseps. And, and, and Bartholdi actually was hired by the, the Egyptian ruler to create this statue. The, uh, luckily, I guess for, for us, uh, the Egyptian ruler, the, the Khedif uh, Ishmael ran out of money and he wasn't able to, to, to finance this. And, and so the, the, this, this Egyptian, version of, of, of liberty never got built, but it, the idea was that, that the Suez Canal would allow the East and the West to come together in, in liberty. And here he's quite different from the, the Gre Greco-Roman image that, that he would end, end up with. But um, we can see here that, that this would be a Arab woman, an Arab woman, a, a peasant woman, it, it would fit in with the Egyptian situation. And uh, this is given, this, this image here, here has given rise recently to the, the, the idea that, well, the, the original vision of the Statue of Liberty was as a Muslim woman. And this is 
not quite accurate because Bartoli wasn't thinking in religious terms. He was really thinking more of, of, about representing this Egyptian statue in a way that was appropriate to the to the context. And so it wasn't a, a, an image that represented Islam so much as Egypt and its great ancient heritage. But this didn't this 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 didn't get built because the, the money wasn't there. And so he he actually ended up repurposing this Egyptian statue to fit with the situation in the United States. And so all these things came together to give Bartolo the uh, the uh, idea of creating the Statue of Liberty that we know that would represent the abolition of the, the revolutionary heritage of, of liberty and the colossal, all these things would come together in the statue that we know. But, um, and so here we see the, the, the definitive model of the, the Statue of Liberty, but what would she look like? What would her face be? Most scholars who have looked into this have decided that it was Bartholdi's mother's face, Charlotte Bartholdi, who would be the, 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 the image for the face of the Statue of Liberty. And we have some pretty good evidence for, for this, and that Bartholdi was very close to his, his mother. And when he was he first went to the United States in the early 1870s, he wrote her every day. Those letters have been preserved and you can read them in the, in the New York Public Library, as I did. But one, there's one kind of troubling question about all this, and, and that is that if Bartholdi really meant to make his mother's face the image of the Statue of Liberty, wouldn't he have told her that? And nowhere in his letters does, does he mention this. And so there's somewhat controversial uh, the, the idea that it's his mother's face. And, and this is a pretty idealized portrait of his of his mother's face. And, and so recently there is a Natalie Salman who did some research into her family bound and she discovered an American branch of her family. And this woman, Sarah Koblenzer, who is known to have visited Bartholdi's workshop in the 1870s. And what, what Natalie Selman argues somewhat convincingly, although we don't have definitive evidence, is that this young woman who visited the, the, the workshop and who posed for Bartholdi, it's her face. And you can see some, you can see some similarities here. And so in, in around 1875, Bartholdi got to work and he resolved to build a statue in, in the world. And this posed a, a really difficult engineering dilemma. It, it couldn't be a traditional bronze sculpture. It was just it was just too big. And especially since all along Bartoli planned to build the thing in Paris and then move it to the United States. And so Bartoli recruited Gustav Eiffel, Eiffel Tower fame, to build the inner structure, the skeleton of the Statue of Liberty. And, and so in many ways, the, the Statue of Liberty, which is everybody knows, was unveiled in, in 1886, but, but built uh, during the 10 years before that, it has an Eiffel Tower inside. And what allows the thing to stand is this structure of wrought iron that is very similar to the structure that will be revealed to the world in 1889 with the, the, the Eiffel Tower. And I don't unfortunately have time to go into the engineering, but, but all I'll say here is that what we see in the Statue of Liberty is a, a sh sheets of, of copper that are riveted together. And each of those sheets is about the thickness of a penny and a half. And that copper is stretched around and hung on this inner skeleton that, that you can see. Okay, and so Bartoli got to work. He built the Statue of, of, of Liberty entirely in Paris. And he had 
the, the, the construction process extensively photographed. And this is one of my, my favorite photographs because you can just see how colossal this statue is and also how complicated it was to build it. And so here is the construction of the hand, which has a, a wood base inside. And then there's plaster over top. And then around the, 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 the plaster, there was an, an, another mold built. And finally, the, the, the copper sheets were placed around that mold and hammered into place. And because this statue is so enormous, it could be built only one section at a time. And the, the, the calculations, especially given the, the technology in the late 19th century, the calculations were extraordinarily difficult to do. And they involved building a, a, a model about one quarter the size and running plumb lines from the model to these different aspects of the of the statue that that were being built and so uh, one of the the photographs it's a, it's it's a little grainy but this is a, this is and i i was able to photograph this in in an archive in the it's going up and up here this is going to be the the innards of of the of the torch and one of the first elements of the statue that got built was the hand and the torch and here you can you you, you can see this and but one of the things that's really important to keep in mind about all this is that the financing of, the, of this was iffy all along there was no government money no government money, either from the French government or the American government. And most, most, most people think that this was a common Franco-American political project. It wasn't. All the money was privately raised. And in order to, to come up with some, some money, Bartoli resolved to display an important part of, this, of the Statue of Liberty, the hand and the torch, at the international celebration of American independence, which took place in Philadelphia in 1876. And he, Bartoli managed to slip this in right at the end of this, of this World's Fair. And it became the most popular element visited. You can see people up here, you could climb to the top and, and, and visit it. It was the most photographed element of this whole thing. And, and this display in, in Philadelphia made New Yorkers a little worried because even though there was some resistance at first, and maybe we can talk about this in the Q&A if you, if you like, there was some resistance at first to accepting this gift from the, from the French. One of the things that made New Yorkers decide that they should have it is how popular the hand and the torch were in Philadelphia. And, and so Brooke already, already showed this, this image. And, and so New Yorkers brought this to, to Madison Square Park where it was displayed for, for a number of years, extraordinarily popular. It became a major tourist attraction. And so here you see one of the, the, the many drawings and photographs of the Statue of Liberty going up in Paris. It was fully built in a workshop out, out on the outskirts of, of, of Paris. And you can see these sort of classic Haussmann era buildings of, of, of Paris surrounding it. It was so popular in, in France that there was actually a campaign to keep it there. There were a number of, of journalists and public figures who, who, who said that, uh, well, why give this up? This is, this, is, this is our statue and why give it to the United States? But, but Bartoli was determined that this would be a gift representing Franco-American friendship. And so there, there are all kinds of renderings. Here is a, a, a painting by, by Victor Dago, which is in one of the major museums in, in, in Paris. And you can see the, the statue surrounded by scaffolding going up. And it actually stood in Paris for two solid years before it was dismantled like a kind of erector set 
and packed into 212 shipping cartons sent by train to the port at Le Havre and put on a ship which sailed over to the United States. And uh, those shipping crates were emptied out onto what was then called Bedloe's Island, only later would it become Liberty Island, and it would sit there. Those crates would sit there unopened while the Americans went through the very difficult process of raising the money that was needed to build the the pedestal. And so the idea was that French money would pay for the statue, American money would pay for the the pedestal. And the the Blue Ribbon American Fundraising Committee wasn't able to come up with the money. And the reason why the pedestal finally got built is that the newspaper publisher, Joseph Pulitzer, stepped in And he himself was an immigrant and he really was moved by Emma Lazarus' positive view of of welcome to to immigrants from abroad, people who wanted to create a new life. Pulitzer obviously had become very successful starting as a publisher in St. Louis and moving to New York. He he started a newspaper called the New York World. And in, in 1885, he undertook a campaign to collect the money. And this was a popular newspaper, not an elite newspaper. And he used kind of populist rhetoric saying that the elites could pay for this, but they don't want to. The people should pay for it. And and Pulitzer was able to to get over 100,000 donations to raise the $125,000 that were needed to finally succeed in building the pedestal for the Statue of Liberty. And so with the the pedestal, the money raised, the the pedestal went up quickly in 1885 and 1886. The Statue of Liberty was then unpacked and rebuilt. You couldn't use scaffolding because of the wind in, in the Statue of Liberty. And so the only way to get up there was to hoist people on the, the kinds of things that that window washers used to to wash the windows of skyscrapers. And then finally, at the end of October, 1886, the Statue of Liberty was unveiled and ready to to, to begin its career as one of the greatest icons of America. Thank you. So, how, how do we do? You want, how do we want to do the? Ed, thank the yeah. I'm, I will. Um, I'll field the questions from questions in the chat. Ed, thank you. That was absolutely fascinating. I think we wish all wish we could have hear you for another hour. Um, that's the problem of time limits. Um, um, I'm fascinated also to to hear what people's questions will be, and I love the image of Lady Liberty towering over modest um, built Paris, um, which is, it's an extraordinary image. And Abigail, thank you for opening this program and for giving your voice to that um, extraordinary Langston Hughes poem. Um, So let me start um, to look at questions that are in the chat for you. Okay. Um, Amy Essek asks, what approval process and different groups were involved with this significant subject and location? I think she means of placing the Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor. Yeah, so that, that, was, that was very, very complicated. And uh-huh. as, as I suggested, there were a, a number of people in, in the United States who were suspicious of this French gift. Well, what do the French want in return for this? A, a lot of people asked. And, and also Bartholdi was kind of arrogant. You know, he, he didn't actually ask anybody whether they wanted the Statue of Liberty and he didn't ask anybody where it might go. And so he decided on his own to put it on this island. And there, 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 were, there, were, there were a number of people who thought, well, it should go in the new Central Park. And some, some people thought, well, it should stand at the Battery. 
But Bartoli was, was adamant that it should go in the narrows of New York Harbor because that would mean that every ship entering the harbor would have to almost touch the, the, the Statue of Liberty. And, and so he, he pressed and he pressed and he pressed and, and, and he got his way. But it and, and eventually the, the U.S. government, which owned Bedloe's Island, signed it over to, to, to New York City so that it could accommodate the Statue of Liberty. There was a little bit of jealousy from the state of New Jersey because because Bedloe's Island is much closer to New Jersey than it actually is to, to, to Manhattan, for sure. And, um, and when the, the U.S. Congress was asked to put up some money hundred thousand dollars to help pay for the, the the pedestal it was voted down and the new york state assembly also voted down a fifty thousand dollar appropriation to to pay for this and so one of the the takeaways is that it was the french and the american people not their governments who paid for this monument mm -hmm. I, I see a question about the the renovation of the statue. Is it would be okay to talk about 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 that? Sure, sure. And then I'll and, and so then I, okay, go ahead. The, yeah. yeah, you're. you're right. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right that Leah Iacocca led a spectacularly successful fundraising effort to, to because the, the the Statue of Liberty really needed renovation. The wrought iron skeleton was rusting away. And mm -hmm. there's some chance that the Statue of Liberty could have collapsed. And so it, it, it needed an, a renovation using a non-ferrous metal, which is one of the things that was incredibly costly. And also it needed to be cleaned up. And the, the, the truth is that the American government was never willing to put up the money to keep the, the Statue of Liberty in good shape. I mean, its exterior was really dirty. The inter interior was falling apart. The, 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 the torch wasn't, wasn't working. It was never properly lit. And so in the, the first half of the, of the 1980s, a, a major Franco-American project to, to, to renovate the Statue of Liberty got done. And uh, Iacocca raised so much money that he was also able to renovate Ellis Island with that same fundraising effort. Right. Um, there's a question from Patricia Laria um, to you, Abigail. Um, Abigail's investigation of the Statue of Liberty through her work, Light of Freedom, is what's prompted this, this conversation today. And Patricia asks you, Abigail, thank you for the sculpture now on display in the park. I find it fascinating that there are chains under her feet, but that it's not well publicized. Could you speak to why you choose to highlight the flame over the chains? Well, uh, the the image, the, the New York Public Library image of the, the torch with the hand being in the park initially was what started this whole journey. And um, I thought that it could encapsulate and talk about all of the things that were going on in America in 2020. But then also thinking about um, the kind of coarse nat nature of freedom or, or potentially what does freedom even mean? And then thinking about you know the communities of people who have been at the margins of uh, American democracy and have forced it to, you know, be true to what it said on paper from the very beginning. So thinking about people power, and I, I think it's really beautiful, as Professor Berenson just said, that, you know, the French and American working class basically were the people who paid for this thing, right? And so uh, thinking about it as uh, for the people, by the people, you know, paid for by the people that democracy and you know, freedom is probably held more deeply in the hearts of um, people who aren't benefiting from it, uh, you know, rather than the, the government and, and structures and powers that do. Thank you. Um, Professor Berenson, Sarah Stein Sapir asks you, what do you think is the significance of Abigail's sculpture, particularly as compared to the original meaning of the statue? Well, I, th I think it's very it's very significant because it 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 recalls that original meaning, 
mm. and uh, about a liberation and 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 the the, the horror of uh, of enslavement and the 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 the, 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 the incredible importance of, of of ending it and um, and also the 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 symbolism of the torch which which means so many things mm. and but it's the light of freedom and it's also enlightenment that is the knowledge and understanding that that makes freedom possible so i think there's a very close connection that's one of the really wonderful things about abigail's sculpture is that it really reminds us of this incredibly significant history um professor alan gray is asking if you think or maybe this is a question for both of you uh, do you think that the Statue of Liberty is still an effective or accurate symbol of American immigrant sentiment, despite her white race? Abigail, do you want to respond? Sorry, I just had a phone ringing in the background. Um, I don't, I, I mean, she's green. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't think of her because there's so much, um, She's empty, right? She has that that Eiffel Tower uh, interior, right? Like thinking about the the porous nature of her, right? That she was built to be flexible, that wind can pass through her, and and thinking about that she is the embodiment of an ideal that we still don't understand, right? Like it's the mm -hmm. portrait of a of an of ancient ideology that's like welded through different contemporary players, right? And so, I don't think. I don't think an idea can have a race. So I don't see her as, you know, having, uh, you know, European features or, or you know, whatever. I, I don't, I don't see her as that. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. The, the Statue of Liberty is abstract deliberately. It doesn't represent any particular individual, which is one reason why the Statue of Liberty has been shielded from the contemporary contemporary uh, movement to question monuments that refer to, to to racism and 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 slavery and and so the one really prominent historian of sculpture Albert Boyne called the Statue of Liberty a hollow icon and I think that's really significant. Now it is true though that nowadays most immigration doesn't come from Europe. And it comes from Asia and, and Latin America. And so there is another much less positive symbol of Asian immigration, and that's Angel Island, which is in the, the San Francisco Bay. And, um, and this is where immigrants coming mostly from China had to land. And the overwhelming number of, of people from China who landed, who landed on Angel, Angel Island were sent back whereas just about everybody who landed on Ellis Island was allowed to enter and this country. And so there is certainly an inequality in the 19th century immigration from Europe as compared to the much more recent immigration from, from, from Asia. And so I think we should, we should keep that in mind. But still, I think that because of the abstract qualities of the Statue of Liberty, it can still represent for us today the, the idea of welcome to people who are seeking a new life in this country. Mm -hmm. and, and one of our um, uh, listeners says that she is part of the journey of ever, in, ever evolving symbolically, which I, which I think that's right. Um, Karen Lemmy, who is our colleague um, from the uh, curator from the Smithsonian American Art Museum um, is asking, Abigail, she'd like you to say more about your use of found materials and she also wants to mention that Bartholdi um, obtained a U.S. patent for the statue as a bust in which he described the face is of the Greek type. Presumably he meant ancient Greek. So I think the, the bell in particular, I was thinking about a uh, call to liberty or referencing the Liberty Bell or thinking about bells as being a call of action. And it's a decommissioned school bell from a small town in Illinois that's uh, underneath the flame that's in the, in the center of the torch. And then above that is the uh, painted mannequin arms that are the flame. And so those were more kind of cobbled together and collected from 
past projects and from material for the arts here in uh, New York City, but uh, thinking about um, just, you know, what is the enduring power of this, of these ideas, right? Like that, that, you know, people long to be free or, you know, stretch themselves towards this kind of idea of freedom. And even, you know, the, the promise of that with that not being fully realized to how, you know, that is the thing that is passed from, you know, generation to generation and thinking about the, the movement that happened, um, you know, Black Lives Matter moment that happened that united the nation under, you know, this Trump administration and through coronavirus here in 2020 of people banding together and, you know, uh, recognizing the humanity of the long, you know, suffering of, of black, black people in, in America. But I, I think, um, so yeah, so that's, that's what I'll say about those, those found materials. And then I think, you know, I think in terms of it, it being described as the, the face of a, a Greek type, I think that's, I mean, that's what this nation is kind of like based based on in a, an adjacent kind of way, maybe not directly, right? Like that there is always this kind of long look backwards to align yourselves with um, ancient civilizations that you think really might have gotten something right. <laughs> you know, I think there's a there's at least 300 years history of, of that going on, you know, here in the, in the United States where, you know, like that. And, you know, in Europe too, I, I just, you know, I just discovered that the torch uh, procession that happens with the Olympics is, you know, was started by the Nazis in 1936 and that it still continues, you know, like, so thinking about, oh, you know, how the Roman Empire is always this great touchstone for everyone and how the even the Romans were looking back at like the ancient Egyptians, right? Like there's always this long look backwards to try to claim symbols and, you know, structures that could hold this kind of permanence, right? That maybe then, you know, your, your brief moment here on this planet will be, you know, crystallized within an architectural form or through the power of a, of a monumental sculpture. Mm -hmm. Um, our, I know that our colleague, um, Jose Diaz, who's the chief curator of the Warhol Museum is listening in. And um, I believe he's asking, um, this came through in the Q&A, he mentions the refurbishment for the statue in the mid 1980s that it was covered in scaffolding. Um, and he also says that Andy Warhol depicted it on the cover of his book titled America. Um, Abigail, he's asking if you can talk about the scaffolding in your work. So those images of the renovation actually really inspired me to put the scaffold around the sculpture. And so thinking about this, again, that this is an ancient idea that is you know, old, and that's why it has that kind of patina on the torch and the ways in which that people are the ones that are the fire that keeps it, you know, burning and continuing. And that it's always a thing that is, uh, it's an idea that is continually under construction. So that's why the scaffolding is around it. And then the ways in which labor is fetishized and valorized in this nation, but but people's lives aren't. And so that's why the the scaffolding is also painted gold. Um, Abigail and Ed, we're getting near to the new to, to 12 noon. Um, I just want to say that we have learned so much um, this morning from your work, your research, your scholarship um, on the Statue of Liberty. And I think that you've let us re-see the statue um, from a new perspective and in a new light um, and with open eyes. I should mention that people can go to the Statue of Liberty and take the ferry. Um, it's still open. You can go see it. It's 25% capacity, but there is a ferry. You can go online and, and, um, and get your tickets. It's running to Liberty Island. So thank you all for attending this morning. Abigail and Ed, thank you for your brilliance today. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.